welcome back to the Earth on Survival Guide, the podcast for all disciplines, paths, players, and game masters, with your questers Josh and Dan. I am Dan. I am Josh. And on today's podcast, we will be discussing all things quizzical, because we have another email palooza, which I love these episodes. Uh, so if you have a question for us, or Lou, or Josh, because we actually are going to have an answer from Lou first before we get to any much else, please email us at edsgpodcast at gmail.com or... Go to anchor.fm and leave us a voicemail because we will plop your lovely voice into our uh, feed and let someone other than me or Josh talk for a while. And we'll get to there as well. So how you doing, Josh? I'm doing OK. I'm doing OK. We're getting into the tail end of the year. We are coming up on the end of our third year Woo! of the show. Our premiere episode was in October or early or November of 2020. No, 2019. 20, sorry, 2019, right. 2020 was yeah. our first full year, so this is our third Fair, yeah. full year yes. of doing the show. We've got episode 150 coming up here before too much longer, and we haven't actually talked yet if we're going to be doing anything <laughs> special for that. Right. But we probably need to have that conversation off mic at some point. I think making point. it to 150 is special enough. Not wrong. <laughs> I've heard of something called pod fade where you just kind of like churn out episodes and don't have anything else left. and You just kind of sign off and there's no other episodes. So I think when we decide we're done, we will make an announcement about that. Oh, totally. 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 We'll wrap it up. Unless, you know, barring something bizarre happening. Catastrophic. Yeah, we will do that. We like these email episodes because in one sense, it's less work for us. We don't have to do as much prep. <laughs> Like the research that Dan does ahead of time for his notes and stuff. Yeah. It bumps everything that he's done like off another episode or another week or whatever. So it it, it works out well. It does. I love these. Uh, a, I get to read more. And B, to Josh's point, my memory gap is filled in more when I get to read or reread books that I haven't touched in 20 years. So all is well. So that being said, uh, J uh Lou actually answered us uh, on the Earth Dawn Guild forum yes. about the last episode uh, where he says, yeah, Lou keeps up with the episodes. We asked in the episode that dropped last week last as we are recording this, the, the first of the horrors episode where we talked about the various constructs. And the yeah. question was like, were the Jehuthra and the Spectral Dancer created for Miss of Betrayal or were they created from the book and just used in that adventure? And Lou uh, ad addressed that. He did. He said, started listening to the newest episode of the Earth Dawn Survival Guide podcast about house contention today. And it reminded me that I hadn't yet answered a question that Josh and Dan asked in the previous episode about horror constructs. They noted that both Jehuthra and the Spectral Dancer appeared in Mists of Betrayal and in the core rule book. And they wondered whether where the two creatures originated. In other words, did the designer of Mists of Betrayal take those creatures from the core rules or do we pull those creatures from Mists of Betrayal and include them in the core rules? Both of those creatures were first introduced in the core rules. Actually, the first appearance of the Jehuthra was the cover of the second promotional flyer released in the months leading up to the release of the game. I had that on the back of a magazine somewhere. Uh, when we hired John Terra to write Mr. Betrayal, I sent him a copy of the core rules. I don't recall at what stage the book was in, but the text was probably close to final, and he chose to include Jehuthra and a spectral dancer in the adventure. His working title for the adventure was Blood Journey. I don't recall specifically why we changed the name, but I seem to recall it had something to do with avoiding the word blood in the title. We would obviously eventually use that word when talking about the blood wood, but this was very early in the life of the game line, and we were likely being overly cautious. Fun fact, when I playtested Mist of Betrayal with my group, it was my wife's character, an elven troubadour named Megana, the original version of the character that appeared in the, lot, in the flyers, and then some examples in the core rules, who ended up defeating the Spectral Dancer after most of the rest of the party had tried and were rendered unconscious. I find that last little bit interesting. Like, I knew Magana was a character that his wife, Sherry, had played. That's more than I do. In the game. But Magana in the flyers and in all of the examples in the book is a swordmaster, not a hmm. troubadour. So when he's saying it's like an original, like the original version may have been a troubadour, and then they did a swordmaster. That little bit of things I'm not sure about but no yeah fair discipline discrepancy uh i find interesting because it's like you know just a little bit of trivia that 
doesn't oh, no, matter I, at all in the grand scheme. Of I things. love the tidbits because I I I'm the guy that watches the behind the scenes making of movies and the director's commentary and stuff. I just like knowing how the sausage is made. So those things work for me. So I, I kept reading. Probably I shouldn't have. However, uh, we have other other things to talk about. So we have a uh, Lee returning quite frequent emailer. Thank you, Lee, for uh, giving us content for the show today. Hi, Dan. Hi, Josh. Just a quick response to Patrick's thought on talking about the differences between the editions. I've played first edition and fourth edition. I think Josh is proud of the work he has done on fourth edition. It feels more streamlined and easier to play and easier to understand. Discipline progression is much easier to follow now, I feel as well. Side note, Inve, a pop culture reference, People should or could think of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, 1956. Anywho, have fun, Lee. Yes, uh, the 1956 Invasion of the Body Snatchers, a classic film Mm -hmm. with Kevin McCarthy, I think is the actor's name that's in the lead role. Very well-known character actor. I think became much more well-known later, and now I'm feeling like my brain being the pocket imdb that it is (laughs) i first want to check that i am right about the okay yes so 1956 with kevin mccarthy i was right about the actor's name kevin mccarthy and this is part of the reason why i wanted to like go down this brief like sidebar rabbit hole Mm -hmm. kevin mccarthy perhaps better known as a character actor in his later years he appeared um, in the over the often overlooked and underrated film by Weird Al Yankovic from 1989, UHF. Oh, wow. He was R.J. Fletcher. He was the head of the rival studio, <laughs> the rival network, the, the network affiliate in that movie. And he's done he's he's had a lot of other like great sort of comedic bad guy like sort of like antagonist roles yeah. uh and a lot of voice actor work and stuff like that he is wonderful he unfortunately passed away like about 10 years ago oh man but wonderful wonderful and then there is also the 1978 version of invasion of the body snatchers which is a little bit better known mm. that's the one that has donald sutherland yeah that would be why and has that absolutely iconic bit at the end that everybody has as the meme, which is Donald Sutherland, like, pointing at the camera and, like, doing the scream thing that they did in that movie. Hmm. So, yeah, no, that's that's really cool. Like, you could mine that really well for the inv- ideas when it comes to how you might do a more sort of horror-themed or paranoia-themed inve adventure or story arc. No kidding. Uh, oddly enough, I'm the one person on earth who's never seen either one of those movies. So <laughs> I have seen the 1978 one. There have been a couple of other remakes. There's one that's just called Body Snatchers hmm. that I think might have been just direct to video back in the 90s. Not surprising that that one was was OK. I recall watching that back in my frequent blockbuster visit days. Fair to date myself. <laughs> But the 1978 one is is really good. The 1956 one is a classic. Um, I have seen that, but it has been much longer since I've seen that. Fair enough. So on to one from Maddie Smith. Thank you again, Lee. On to one from Maddie Smith. Uh, this comes to us. Hey, good day, jo- Dan and Josh. Just listening through your episode 138 on Horror Spawn. During the part about Bone Shamblers, Josh commented that they made an appearance in the early prologue episodes of the Legends of Earth Dawn podcast which were now lost to time. These lost episodes were made available again a couple of years ago, rehosted in a new RSS feed by Carlton, who GM'd those first Kira Sinoc uh, episodes, and creator of, amongst other things, the Exploding Dice Bot with Cliff's permission. He has included the RSS feed. I think Josh might include those in the show notes, so if anybody wants to listen to those, they can go find them. Unfortunately, yes. some of the links in the feed are broken, omitting the MP, .mp3 file extension required to make them whole, but that's easily remedied if you get them links into your browser and add the extensions manually. Incidentally, the short-lived third group of players and the Tales of Trevar episodes from those early days were also rehosted at this RSS feed. There will be two feeds in your show notes. As always, thanks for the informative and entertaining podcast. Looking forward to many more to come. Warm regards. Maddie Smith, First Circle Game Master, First Circle Podcaster. Yeah, Maddie uh, was... 
I believe on a panel I did at uh, Fredonia Con, not the most recent one. So the one back in 2021, I did a panel about actual play podcasting. Yeah. And I think Maddie was one of the um, <clears throat> guests on that. I could be mistaken. That rings a bell. But yeah, that, that does that does ring a bell. Yes, I will try to remember to at least have those links in the show notes. Fair. And even less likely try to remember to <laughs> drop them as links when I announce the episode on Twitter. Um so that those will be directly available there. We'll see how Josh's memory uh, works in the, in the upcoming weeks. On to one we got from Aaron. This is about ghoul venom. So hi, guys. As always, love the podcast. The work you guys are doing is informative, entertaining, and most importantly, devious game master plot inspiring. I have a few... Our work here is done. <laughs> exactly. Call it a night. Uh, I have a few quick questions on ghoul venom. One, can you be affected by multiple ghoul venom, i.e., you get hit by two attacks from two separate ghouls. On your next turn, do you take two lots of venom damage on top of any additional attacks coming in from the ghouls? Yes. Sounds right, since you have to kill the one ghoul to get it to stop. I mean, ultimately, it depends how you want to handle the stacking of that sort of thing. Normally, when you have a duplicate effect that goes onto a character, most commonly with regards to a buff spell and enhancement spell like air armor or something, you know, generally a little bit shorter lived, but any kind of spell or talent effect that is a duplicate. And the same goes like if you are doing taunt against a, a, an enemy, only the the most effective, the highest version of that is in effect. And what can happen is that it can sort of overall extend the duration of the effect. Depending on your group, you might want to look at that when it comes to ghoul venom affecting your player characters because multiple poisons can be really nasty. <laughs> from a verisimilitude, from a realism point of view, yeah, you could have multiple effects on that to indicate that you have a higher dose in your system and therefore are being affected more quickly, more powerfully. But from a numbers standpoint, that could wind up with dead characters very, very quickly. I would say those are your two options. The lower circle your character, your player characters are, the more likely I would be to not have it stack, simply to avoid lots of untimely deaths. If they are higher circle or have the resources like last chance salves and the poultices and so forth that help against poison resistance and things like that, then maybe stacking it won't be quite too bad. But I would say make the decision that makes the most sense for the scenario and just kind of stick to it. Agreed. Question number two, as the venom is magical in nature, can this still be cured by Achilux's poultice as per any natural poison? Yes. Asked and answered. Because the poultice is magical. Yeah. It is a magical healing aid. It is alchemical in nature. And so I absolutely think that it should provide the bonuses or benefits that it does to any other poison or venom. Sounds good to me. Question three. Assuming you do not kill the offending ghoul, how long will the poison last? Or is this indefinite? Uh, for example, you must kill the ghoul to stop the poison. It is not indefinite. There are stats for venom in the... GM's guide. Yeah. And I'm just flipping to the page now. So the ghoul venom has an interval of six slash one. Um, if you look at the rules for poison that's earlier in the GM's guide, or you go back to the episode where he talked about poisons, mm -hmm. the interval is the duration that the damaging effect goes in. It has six tests that are made, you know, one test per round. Um, the character gets a resistance test before the damage test is made each round. So there are multiple opportunities for them to shake off the effects, to resist the effects. But ultimately, it will last six rounds. Yeah. And then when that dose is done, if they get hit again, then a new dose might start. The damage itself is permanent in the sense that it lasts until it is healed through normal healing means. But it's 
six rounds, six tests Ooh. is the maximum that it would go if you do not kill the ghoul or successfully resist the poison ahead of time. It's a step 10 venom. Ooh. So you kind of need to get lucky on your toughness roll if you don't have a boost from a magical aid of some sort. Yeah, no kidding. Because uh, if you can make it six rounds, whew, good on you. That's a lot of potential damage. It's a damage step of 10 yeah. each round. Mm -hmm. And it's not resisted by any armor, I don't believe. No, it's, that's in your bloodstream. Like I said, having <laughs> multiples of that is... <laughs> brutal exactly uh air goes on to finish up i would also be keen on hearing some stories you have told around your own tables maybe if you were keen to share maybe doing a session of funny adventure tales that listeners could write in with their stories as well just a thought to break things up a little if you are running short on content safe travels adventurers aaron well i don't think we're in danger of of running short on content anytime soon but i think that's a cool idea i like it i like it too we'd have to put it there's one story that I have told multiple times about the exploded dispel magic test against the player character that I could have decided actually killed them outright based on the situation, <laughs> but I won't go into that now. Fair enough. Uh, I figure if anybody writes anything in, 750 words or less. Yeah. Keep it to 750. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it like short and to the point. Yes. Enough set up so that we can understand yeah. the situation, but try and keep it. Brief. To the point. Yeah, brief. We'll, we'll start filing those away for when we do get short on content. Anyway, um, which is not for any time soon. So, <laughs> Or, I mean, if we get enough of them quick enough, we might just do an episode that is those. Exactly. Uh, so we have a new one from Daniel. Not me. Seriously, not me at all. Uh, hello, Josh and Dan. This is kind of a long one. I picked up the fourth edition Earthdawn books at Gen Con a few years ago, pre-pandemic, uh, playing first edition. I was actually a contributor to the Arcane Mysteries of Bar Save book way back when. I have circled back around to the system and recently picked up Mystic Paths and started catching up on your podcast as part of preparing to get a game going soon. So I'm a ways behind on episodes. Take your time, Daniel. You got some, you got a ways to go. First question, the Windmaster and Tail Dancer paths. Why do these paths require strictly melee weapons as a requirement? It seems like a more combat-oriented Beastmaster using unarmed combat would be an interesting fit for both paths. This may have been sparked by Dan's comment about tail dancing fighting style resembling the capoeira martial art and the image of a windling windmaster swooping by slicing their opponents to death with a thousand cuts using hawk talons for hands. Okay, I'm going to address tail dancer first. Yeah. I was not the system rules developer for anything in the paths book i contributed help with the essay writing and some of the concepts so, fleshing out steering. and things like that i did writing wise contribute to the tail dancer chapter yeah. semi-significantly yeah. like i think maybe about half of it is stuff that i ended up writing but that's yeah. beside the point so there's a few things going on with the the tail dancer one is that it was originally conceived, as we discussed in the episode yeah. about it, a homebrew discipline that was created and published in the Earth Dawn Journal. And it was not until third edition, possibly classic, but definitely third edition, that a an official version of it was made. The tail dancer discipline was always presented as a specialist swordmaster, that was to say that it was a sword master that had a style that took advantage of the Tuscrang's tail. And yes, on the one hand, I do recognize in one sense that it might seem mechanically better for Beastmaster, which has unarmed combat and a talent that can enhance unarmed combat damage to be a tail dancer then because fighting with the tail by default is unarmed combat why would you require melee weapons if that's the focus Fair. of it my primary response to that is that the beastmaster is not temperamentally suited is not societally suited within the tuscrang culture to be the, a tail dancer, right? It, it doesn't kind of fit that. You also need to take into account at least a little bit that in 
previous editions, prior to the removal of any official restrictions, Tuscrang could not be Beastmasters in first edition. Yeah. It was a denied discipline. That restriction has been lifted, but generally speaking, Tuscrang probably would be less common temperamentally to be a, a Beastmaster for whatever reason. Also, you've got this whole background of the Tail Dancers, especially within the fourth edition Paz framework and the essay that's included in there as being something that was developed initially and primarily out of, speaking of last week, the Contention War yeah. College. This is a special thing above and beyond the normal training, and Beastmasters are not something that are going to be trained at the Contention War College because they teach warriors and swordmasters and possibly cavalrymen. Yeah. And so ultimately, the reason that there is a restriction, a requirement for melee weapons among tail dancers is because the society, the culture, the organization, the schools of tail dancers require you to know how to fight with a sword, in part because part of the style is strapping a an actual weapon to your tail and fighting with it. And that is something that is tied in with melee weapons. That's my addressing of that is that it is not rule that is there for a mechanical kind of thing so much as a reflection of the culture and style and reality within the setting that the tail dancers as a thing exist as now there are tail dancers that are not necessarily part of the war college there are potentially some schools of tail dancers that are part of the other aropagoy or, or great houses or whatever in fact, I think originally the tail dancer was conceived of as a purely Kistulami yes. thing. Like it was just the the winged Tuscrang. It was not something that was available as part of the regular Tuscrang. That's how it was in your Thun Journal, yes. I think actually that 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 the term tail dancer might have come from the I have not done the research to back this up, so I could be misremembering, but it's possible that the term tail dancer was originally coined or came from the Tuscrang chapter in Denizens of Earth on Volume 1, where they were talking about the Kistulami. Mm -hmm. and, and it's possible that that may have been where that originated. And then somebody took that and developed the discipline for the Earth on Journal. I, I have not done the checking in terms of where things showed up there. But that's basically the, the reason why melee weapons is required is because the people who are going to teach you to be a tail dancer require you to know how to fight with a sword, primarily because of the story of it being something that is an elite class invite only to a big chunk of the war college, like an extra level of prestige, but also available in other to scrang martial traditions. So that's where that came from. The Windmaster, I don't have as strong a response there, but again, you're going to be looking at a situation where you've got warriors and cavalrymen and so forth, probably as the primary defenders of windling spaces, and so are likewise part of their training, part of the schooling, part of the things that they teach you as part of the path is to take advantage of the weapon training of the of the martial traditions of windlings. I do not feel as strongly about that one, but simply it's the the idea that beastmasters typically are not the ones that are going to be forming squads and units that are going to be defending towns and villages the way that warriors and cavalrymen and to a slightly lesser extent swordmasters are likely to yeah they're just more antisocial that particular aspect of things is something that maybe morgan would potentially be better to address but i don't know that he has a whole lot of interest in debating <laughs> that point with people Fair. because the whole like tail dancer unarmed combat beastmaster thing has come up in other places and ultimately if you don't like it you can yeah. change it but there's a big chunk of lore connected reasons for why it is the way that it is and we are going to operate under that assumption and go from there yeah, fair enough hope that answers it for you i mean that's my answer that's how i address fair. it Fair. i have no two cents to add to that so 
because what else would I say? Second question. As a general design philosophy, why do most low circle damage spells do something else on additional successes instead of adding plus two effect like most other forms of attack? Feels like those are actually two slightly Fair. different questions. So to kind of address the, the first part, why do the low level spells for the most part do an additional effect or something like that? Something extra in addition to damage. That's partly to one, make them, I think, a, a little bit more interesting in one regard. It helps reinforce the themes or ideas of the discipline early on. The elementalist, for example, gets a spell that reduces armor, you know, reduces physical armor, whereas the nethermancer gets one that reduces mystic armor and the wizards, I think, reduces mystic defense and the illusionists provides a penalty to sensing tests or like something like that. Like the secondary effect is kind of thematically flavorful with regards to the discipline. The other part of that is to, I think, help reinforce the idea of the magicians not being simple, for lack of a better term, archers without ammunition. Okay. You know, where you're just slinging blast spells or damaging spells round yeah. after round. People have their issues with the design of, of spells and so forth and, and the ones that are available in the core book. Um, when it comes to the magician disciplines, with a lot more of a focus on support and group enhancement or negative effect mitigation and stuff mm-hmm. like that, rather than being a variety of different damage <laughs> damage effects. So there's that piece of it. And then there's the, I think, secondary question is on those spells, or why is it in general that most spells or damaging spells don't do extra damage on extra successes on spell casting the way that you get the base yeah, yeah. default is extra damage on combat yeah melee weapons where instead it's just extending the duration i don't really have a strong answer yeah. on that i would say that it's to again reinforce the idea of the effect of those being as much to put on status effects that will help the rest of the group Mm -hmm. as opposed to just being pure damage and so having the extra successes sort of default to extending the duration of the effect rather than enhancing the effect itself in a lot of cases is why the choices were made there are some exceptions um astral spear uh for example from the the um I think that's a wizard spell um, or is that I think is there, like one of the one of the other low circle damage spells that doesn't have a secondary effect does extra damage on successes. I forget whether it's wizard yeah. or another answer. I think it's another okay. answer. Actually, I think um, the wizard spell flame flash does extra damage on successes. There are a couple of examples of those. But I think, uh, again, it's just a way that those spells were approached to try and reinforce the flavorful themes of the magicians and the purpose that those disciplines serve within the game roles of being more of a team support enhancement encounter control force multiplier kind of thing rather than blasty fair i figure if it was the bread and butter spells then the bread is the spell and the better the butter is the extra effect it actually does like you said reduce armor or whatnot so i'm just yeah But yeah, these are your bread and butter spells. They're they're going to be the ones who you you use every single day. Well, potentially. I mean, if you're an adventuring type, they are the zero thread damage spells. And so they are the way that they are to give magicians, if situation is whatever, that they are just able to sling a little bit of damage every round. I don't like the idea of a magician just basically being, like I said, an an archer without ammunition, because there's already a sort of powerful ranged attack character. And I think the the strengths of a spellcasting discipline of a magician are better and more versatile than just simply, you know, how much boom can you bring? I mean, there's plenty of opportunity for them to bring boom, 
but there's a lot of other cool stuff as I well. I also think I also think this is one of those where it's designed this way because it is used it's your first circle spell. You should be using this almost every single day, almost every single uh, week or so, and that you shouldn't abandon them for a higher circle spell once a higher circle spell comes along. I think that's something a, a little bit different. I don't necessarily think that there is an issue with once you get into, say, journeyman mm-hmm. circles, where you have more spells that are available and, and potentially more damaging yeah. spells, and you've got the enhanced matrix to have a, a pre-woven thread or something, to maybe not rely on earth darts or whatever quite yeah. so much. Like that's sort of a, a a separate thing. But we talked about this, I think, multiple times with spell casting is because you don't have a limited number of slots the way you do in a spell slot system yes. like D&D. You don't necessarily need to have 10 different or 15 different mm-hmm. varieties of damage yeah. dealing spells because what are you doing at that point? I mean, at that point, you're looking at Elemental Spear from the from mm-hmm. the Elementalist, which has five different versions, one for each yeah. of the elements, you know, and each of which kind of has its own different effect that's in theme with the related element. But what are you going to be doing with a wizard that is equivalent? You get Mind Dagger, you get uh, Astral Shock. You know, there are some damage dealing spells that they get but you do you need 10 different damage dealing spells between first and second circle when you can just have one in the matrix and just cast it over Mm -hmm. and over again you know one of the downsides of having a lot of spells to choose from is that the limit is not the number of spells in the game ultimately when it comes to combat the limit is how many matrices and or matrix items do you have how many spells can you have ready Mm -hmm. to go to cast safely and are you going to fill all of your matrices matrices with six different damage dealing spells? I don't <laughs> think so. I don't approach my character mm-hmm. that way. I will have one, maybe two, depending on the situation, as I know that I suspect I might be getting into, but then having other useful spells. Yeah. Manipulation spells, enhancements, de- you know, debuffs, defense, defense, things like offense, that. Defense, buff. You know, I like to have a variety of what I'm going to do with my with my spellcaster in the party that I'm in, A, and B, with the situation at hand. And so one or two damage dealing, one or two defensive if I've got them. And then, yeah, you know, a whole... there's a big difference, I think, between having 10 different damage dealing spells. How many can you effectively bring to bear in a combat given your matrix limits? Yeah. Right. Or a wider variety of support and utility spells that you would be inclined to use outside of combat when you are not necessarily under the time pressure and can freely swap them out or cast them from your grimoire or something like that when the situation calls for it. Having a wide variety of spells is cool. I completely understand that as an idea. I just don't think more boom is more variety. Fair. I don't, I just don't think different boom it's not a variety that appeals to me. I don't do a lot of work at this point on mechanical design mm-hmm. and stuff like that. That is much more Morgan's realm of things. Mm-hmm. It's not something that appeals to me. No, I look at I look at my spell matrices when I'm playing a spellcaster as a Swiss Army knife. What what tool do I have at the right time <laughs> for this situation? I'm not carrying 15 knives. I'm carrying a knife, a screwdriver, a toothpick, uh, you know, things like that. I always approach it as what kind of situation are we going into and what am I going to most want to have available right to hand and what would it be okay if I either had to spend some time to reattune manually or wouldn't be upset by needing to reattune on the fly. So I would be a lot more inclined to, if I were playing another Mancer, to not necessarily have Spirit Dart in one of my matrices, because it is a first circle spell. And especially if I'm fifth or sixth circle, Mm -hmm. it's going to be really easy for me to reattune on the fly to swap that spell in if I need to. Whereas I'd be more inclined to have my higher circle spells that I want to have to hand right to hand, like the spell that allows you to take the form of a, um, of a night flyer. If you have command night flyers, one of your talents, that is one that is a lot more handy to have ready to go in a matrix because then you don't have to spend a round or two reattuning it, you know, when somebody goes overboard from an airship. Totally. 
Night Flyer's Cloak. That's the name of the that's the name of the spell. So bonus question. Nax. It seems like Nax are very fertile ground for expanding the system, customizing edge talents to better fit a specific character's view of their discipline, and generally expanding the fit, feel, and utility of talents and spells. For example, many of the improved spell knacks and mystic paths feel like they could be generally applicable to a character's of their mag- of their magician discipline and shouldn't be restricted by path. Could you perhaps discuss at some point the design philosophy behind knacks, what they should and shouldn't do for those of us considering homebrew customization, and perhaps give us a glimpse into what might be upcoming in that area in the Deeper Secrets book, hopefully coming soon. Thank you very much for producing the podcast. You guys provide a lot of insight and plethora of ideas with every episode. Daniel, hit it. Uh, so that last bit, I cannot provide any insight. I'm working on my own book. <laughs> I do not have any specific ideas what is going on with uh, what Morgan is developing Deeper for Deeper Secrets. Deeper Secrets. Yeah. The only things I know are the are the same things that are out there in terms of the previews and whatnot that he has put out there. Not a lot with Nax, a lot more focus on spells because that's what a lot people are more interested in. Broadly speaking, I think a knack should allow some additional functionality to a talent that would make sense or provide some kind of special maneuver or replacement of another effect, like of an, of another talent or something like that. As an example of the latter, there are knacks for air sailing, pilot boat that allow you to, when you have a high enough rank, to sort of be able to perform the other talent because the skills and knowledge that you have as a result of air sailing would allow you conceivably to be able to operate a regular waterborne sailboat without too much trouble because the the idea of it being propelled by the wind is very similar. You've just kind of going through a similar medium, right? So there's a knack that once you become skilled to a certain point, you don't need to spend a whole bunch of extra legend points to raise a skill up to a certain point in order to kind of duplicate the effects. The other is to, you know, if there's some kind of neat trick that you think you should be able to do with melee weapons, if you are attacking somebody, that's cool. As long as what you are doing with that, in this case, does not duplicate uh, the effects of another talent, like creating a knack for melee weapons that essentially allows you to duplicate the effects of maneuver or something like that, right? Because there's a talent already that does that. I'm not a huge knack developer. Again, I don't deal so much these days with the the rules side of things. I did a lot of work on the revamp for fourth edition, but when it came to knacks and stuff like that, at that point, Morgan was doing a lot more work in that regard. The spell ones that he mentioned that are connected to paths, I don't have a problem with somebody developing a knack that is not gated behind a path if they want to for an improved spell knack of some sort. I think that's fine. There aren't really any hard rules for developing your own knacks. Not having ever really developed my own knacks, I don't have any strong insights into what would be involved. Um, I think the the first question would be, is this something that is duplicating the effect of an already existing talent or spell? And if so, is it something that makes sense as an extension of what the magic for this talent should do? Or is it starting to tread into the toes of some other abilities shtick? That's sort of the the starting question that I would go go from there. And then beyond that point, like figuring out what rank and yeah. the actual effects and stuff are no i was i was looked at nax as a more refined narrower focus of that talent yeah that's it it's just really, okay you can only use this talent a certain couple of times and this is that narrower focus that's why it's a knack that's that's my two cents and i don't often have two cents to add on to josh so uh we have a longer one here from lehman uh, frequent emailer Lehman, thank you again for the artwork. This looks, stuff looks fantastic. 
Uh, I really need to get you my character picture so you can do one for me. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I haven't gotten there. Hello, Dan. Hello, Josh. I have a couple of thoughts to share with you since my last email. One is a potential topic, although I know you already got a flood of them. It goes along with the topic that peeks out from time to time. What to do when someone or multiple people cannot make a session? Depending on the group, there can be different rules for someone uh, else plays the character. To the character goes ghost or my favorite, they are there but ate something bad so can't participate. Ha ha. Some groups have a two-person cancellation policy or my Earthon campaign GM has a I can GM with two players statement, but we recently were on a mission into an illusionist's tower that our troubadour turned illusionist's mentor gave him and we're making our way in. After the first session, real-life bad things befell our troubadour's player, and we marched ahead without him. But something felt missing with us exploring an illusionist's tower without an, our illusionist. I, the windling weaponsmith, got to play trap detector to some fun shenanigans. The following session, we play every two weeks. The game master couldn't be there, and two weeks later, again, another tragedy befell our troubadour player, and he couldn't make the session. So we had the choice to cancel or plow ahead once again in the illusionist's lair without our illusionist. I brought up this idea of secondary characters based in Haven, or somewhere that could be a the original D&D style campaign setting where everyone was in the same town or city and that was home base and you explored outward from there. And if we hit a snag in a current plot due to player shortage, we could still play Earth Dawn. The game master could pre-plan uh, uh, one adventure and plop it down whenever it was needed. A few of us and the game master decided to go with that. And as we made characters, uh, the GM took it in, in an Earth Dawn direction and made us a crew of an airship. The Twisted Muse. We even got a short intro adventure, secondary, and even tertiary characters provide good benefit. Uh, one, if a vital person to the plot or too many people can't make the session, you can still play without the plot getting derailed or feeling off. Two, the game master only has to have one side adventure planned ahead. No long-term plots or hooks needed. Three, in a town, everyone is there, so it's a starting point. On an airship, the game master just can put us where he wants us. We can go where the captain directs us. Four, in the unfortunate event a character dies, a backup character could be ready to enter the party. Set Five, character concepts can be explored without needed uh, to remove an established character, such as I wanted to try an Obsidian Sky Raider with a Hulk complex. Uh, he's normally calm, collected, and cordial, but when a fight starts, he releases the beast because he's always angry. Or six, personal, I get to make pictures of more Earthon characters. Anyway, I thought this might be a good idea to throw out there. I use the hometown multiple characters in my own game, and it's worked great. Long plots are when everyone can make it. One-nighters are when people miss, and we keep the same world time, and people can see their influence locally. Pictures inclu uh, He includes some pictures for Josh and I. We'll see if we can post those as well. Secondarily, I do have some second edition comments. My previous Earth on game was second edition. I'm not sure if the Game Master used the timeline or not, but second edition did have knacks. In the companion book, I have it, uh, they were discipline and talent-based. I started about 2014 in second edition, quickly found fourth, and tried to get the Game Master and, and or group to convert, but that got pushed back as the other emailer did. But now, after fourth edition, everyone who did first and second loves fourth more. And while my fifth circle windling eats karma like Pez, my obsidian is definitely not sing, uh, slinging around karma. And even in the main group, our fifth circle troll warrior spends his carefully. The talent options is the mechanic that sold us. The not buying karma was just icing on this cake. Also, I do recall a humongous cube with pyramids and invade inside it during our second edition campaign. Maybe that was an actual uh, living room games thing. Don't know. Anyway, thank you for continuing the podcast. I look forward to it every Wednesday, and I'm continuing to love Earth Dawn 4th Edition. Lehman. Thank you, Lehman. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add right at this moment with regards to player attendance. I think you've got some good ideas there in terms of like having secondary characters and a lower stress one shot type situation that you can use if you are in a place where you can't easily hand wave the absence of a one of the player characters that's certainly one way to approach it so yeah you raised some good points with regards to that i don't have a whole lot of other commentary in that regard certainly you Got some good points Absolutely. there. I'm repeating myself at this point. <laughs> You're fine. Uh, we got a last one here from Scott. So this is also kind of a long one. Greetings, Dan and Josh. Thank you for the great information on 4th Edition in your podcast and keeping alive one of the greatest RPG environments ever. 
I am so thrilled to come back to gaming in Bar Save. Love that it is back home with Fossa, and your podcast helps that transition and getting back into it. If you like origin stories, I picked up Earthone in 1993 while I was in the Navy. It was new. It was not D&D. I tend to like non-mainstream more than over-commercialized stuff, and I loved Battletech by Fossa. I was elected the Game Master since I bought the books, ran some sailors through Mist of Betrayal, and infected. After getting out of the Navy in 94, moved back to Alaska and remained a wallflower fan of the whole environment of Earth Dawn. I moved to North Carolina in 97, that's a move, and tried to get a steady group going around 2000. Got a couple of sessions in using Mists of Betrayal, picked up bar save and parlance box sets and, petered, and it petered off. I also ran small sessions at a local gaming convention, played in, one of Dragon, played in one at Dragon Con and another at Gen Con around the same time. A local used books and stuff store. Ed McKay had some someone dump a bunch of first edition books and material, so I bought all that they had in the hopes of playing again one day before my pattern broke up and vanished. I have it all, a couple missing items in PDF, and I feel like a dragon hoarding a sacred treasure. Fast forward through college degrees, careers, two daughters, video games, and my best friend said a couple weeks ago, I would like to play something to introduce my two daughters to role-playing games. Thanks, Stranger Things. I suggested Descent, and then my brain kicked in and said, hey, why don't we get our daughters and some of our regular tabletop board game group friends together to play Earth Dawn? He said, I love the world of Earth Dawn. Yes. So we have our 10 year old daughters playing Earth Dawn with a bunch of old gamers and a middle aged one. Uh, the daughters loved it. The environment is an easy sell and I am no slouch as a GM. So everyone is hooked. The only thing they are disappointed in, uh, in is that we only play once a month. I'm using the Earth Dawn downtime <laughs> system through Discord to keep a slow drip in her veins. I was going to use the ton of first edition that I have, but a friend gave me the PG, uh, the Player's Guide and Game Master's Guide for fourth edition, so we we're making the switch, mainly to support FASA and this product, but still using first edition adventures, hooks, and source material and essays. Uh, when that runs out, I will be getting your other stuff. I don't get to play in the world that I love so much, but every so often I do some searches for Earth Dawn phone game, Earth Dawn PC game, and Earth Dawn movie. And I will never lose hope for any of them. My best friend said, you are a game designer, build a video game for it. But that's like knowing how the magician's illusion is done. The magic is gone, and as you know how it is done. He also said, you know there's a podcast called Earth Dawn Survival Guide. I didn't, but now I'm on episode 23 because I had to start from the beginning, so no spoilers. Thank you so much for keeping the most wonderful game system that no one is playing alive. Scott. Thank you, Scott. Welcome back. That is a great story. You won't probably hear this for a while yet. <laughs> you got 100 to go, dude. If you're only on episode 23, you've got, you know, 100 plus episodes to, to go. That's great. Um, I love the thought of, hey, wait, people are interested in role playing. There's this game that I really like that doesn't get enough attention. Let's do that. Exactly. Appreciate the support. Appreciate the kind words. Love hearing the story. And uh, yeah, getting the next oh, generation totally. in. Way totally, to totally, totally. Yeah. Because uh, if Stranger Things does anything for the industry, that's what it is. We'll take it. Whatever gets him around the table with dice, let's go. So all is well. Uh, we've just about taken up the entire hour. Uh, I love everybody's questions. Please keep them coming. Because again, we love these episodes because they make it easy on us. But then again, Josh gets to flex his brain and hit all the random mosaic that is Earth Dawn, uh, covering all kinds of topics and answers. So any final thoughts? No, uh, keep the questions coming. If you've got those sort of amusing stories, keep them tasteful, yes. please. And relatively brief, if possible, if we collect enough of them to fill an episode, then we then we might do one that just kind of does those. Otherwise, uh, we'll be back next week with another more regular episode. And uh, absolutely. Um, find us in the usual places. Follow us. Uh, don't forget, uh, we've got the YouTube channel mm -hmm. now. I am continuing on pace, posting things the way that I have been. Subscribe if you are not subscribed. Uh, like the videos. Just kind of at least get some attention on them so that the algorithm goes, oh, hey, this is something that's getting yes. engagement. Um, maybe I will recommend it to yeah, other folks. Let the algorithm go pump it out for everybody. Uh, so until next time, folks, uh, you know what? Send us your legend. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>